from a label standpoint, are they going to push that record and say like, yo, this is the one, are we going to fight for this record or are we not? The people have to uprise in a degree, right? Yeah. The FCC now, you know, there was a time you couldn't say certain things on the radio. True. Right, like you couldn't curse. Yo, people drop the N word like it's crazy, but you know you can't say derogatory things against Jews. Well, that's the only right, and you true. just can't. Yeah. Right, so you gotta if you're gonna make a change, then you gotta be about the change. Right. Mm -hmm. Also, too, in these it, it, the companies, the the boards that decide what is appropriate and what's not that can come out, then you gotta petition that. So it's all about once again who's in power. And what you're going to do with the power. If we're not at the table, how can you make a change? My graduates from my school being Forbes. Bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs> F a mic drop. Bag drop. Bag drop. Yes, sir, Ski. We are back home. Yeah for a legendary conversation. A hometown hero. Yes. So Benny Pugh, somebody that we met a few years ago, I think like two years ago. Yeah. Almost three. Almost three. Yeah. So we met him and um, a renaissance man in the music business for over probably 30 years. 30 years. Was the uh, former president of Rock Nation Music. He has a number one selling book out right now. He's a real estate investor. And he's actually from our neighborhood. That's a fact. Which is crazy um, within itself, because when we met him, we didn't actually know he was from the neighborhood. No clue. I, I think upon meeting is when you told, when I we first met, it was like, yo, I rock with y'all. I love what you're doing. Where you from? I said, we from this uh, city called White Plains, but the town of Greenberg. You said White Plains? <laughs> uh, nah, nah, we going to lunch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said, let's do it. <laughs> Yeah, Greenberg. Very rare moment. Yeah. Very rare moment. So. Battle laughs, correct? Yo, damn, your memory good, dude. <laughs> you real, you dangerous. <laughs> so this is going to be a dope conversation. We're going to cover what he's doing now, what he did in the past, mm -hmm. the music business, uh, marketing. Um, he has a big event that he's planning. Uh, once again, number one selling book. Had a transition. He had an almost life fatal accident mm -hmm, a few mm -hmm. years ago which changed the whole perspective on everything so overcoming adversity um a lot a lot to unpack yeah so um first and foremost thank you for joining us appreciate it what's up what's up what's up <laughs> yeah. although i don't know how the format goes i actually stopped watching a couple weeks ago so i could just be fresh with this <laughs> yeah we used to I have conversations tell you, about that i gotta tell y'all man um i'm so very proud of y'all uh just the fact that you know more importantly that you two guys are together in that brothers like you know just seeing this dynamic you know having a partner that's outside of a mate that can you can really trust and move forward this is an amazing amazing opportunity and for me you know this is my you know mama I made it moment <laughs> <laughs> you know the big interview with the big guys you know why not right it makes a lot of sense <laughs> makes it yes sir yes it makes, sir it makes a lot of sense so let's let's get to this mm -hmm. um I want to start at the beginning though that's so cool. I understand that you was a paper boy yeah. Um, so how did you go from paper boy to intern to becoming a CEO? So the crazy thing is the paper boy thing came out of necessity. My parents, we used to go down south every year um, after we after school ended on that Friday. So if school got out on Monday, we left on Friday. School got out on Friday, we drove on Friday down to Orangeburg, South Carolina. And, um, you know... I was a very metropolitan kid, so you know that feeding horses, pigs, shucking peas, and selling watermelons wasn't quite my thing. Uh, so one year I told my pops, like, you know, I had a paper route, and if I gave the paper route up, you know, somebody get your route. So at that point, he said, "Listen, it's okay. If you don't go, I'm gonna, um, you know, I would lose it." So he said it was cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. And then how'd you get in the music business? Oh, now that is a crazy story. So during, so during uh, college, I was a stand-up. And as uh, stand-up comedian, stand-up comic, failed. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What school did you go to? St. John's. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's before they even had the dorms. So Willie Glass, Mark Jackson, all those guys, Boo Harvey, those cats, you know, he's playing in the park. I'm from that era. The '80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. B. And um, a young lady who was the local promoter. 
at uh, Motown Records, she booked me for a show at the Cellar, 96 in Amsterdam. And at the end of the show, she asked me what were my plans. Hadn't put any plans together, hadn't written my resume, done anything. So she said, why don't you come on down and be my intern? You know where we from, I don't know about y'all. Nobody ever told me what an intern was. Mm -hmm. So my sale, my background was sales. So I figured I could do it. It's like, yeah, I'll be your intern. Had no idea what one was. So I went down to Motown in my three-piece seat, three-piece suit, wingtips, attache case. And, uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, music companies are like tech companies today. They fly, people casual, cool. And uh, everybody looked at me. They're like, I was the FBI or I was definitely <laughs> on the wrong floor, right? But um, that was an opening in the beginning for me um, getting into the music business because I had no aspirations. So while I was interning, um, I was uh, very administratively sound. So I used to type 60 words a minute. She had me uh, um, uh, reconciling her T&E, didn't know what T&E was either, it's traveling expenses. So I would take all the expenses and, and uh, this check and I would put it together. And then at one day I felt, you know, very sheepish and angst about like seeing her check. So I said to her, listen, I can't do this. What is this? So she said, well, listen, you know, what we do, meaning this, the company, they pay for her expenses. They pay her gas, they pay her cable, they pay her car note, you know, they pay her airfare and all that drinking and eating we was doing tonight, they paid for that. So that's when I fell in love with the business of music. They they taught teaching about tax write offs. Yeah, all that, <laughs> all that. So yeah, at, at Motown, this is the eighties. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, intern is nineties, nineties, nineties. But you don't stay there long. The next stop is Def Jam. So this is like prominent labels at the time, right? Mm -hmm. So Motown, Def Jam. What was that transition like? What are you? Is it the same role? Because you're not you're not an intern at Def Jam. Are you? Are, are you've elevated? into a, a different position so i'm i'm probably one of the few people i've worked at seven different labels so i went from from motown uh to perspective jimmy jam and terry Lo okay. labels okay. uh label then from there i went to um arista moved to washington dc and uh arista like 90 like right before this is, bad boy this is bad boy this is bad boy this is uh uh la reed right this is um What's his uh, uh, what's his name? What's his name? Uh, Rowdy Records. Oh, okay. um, all of those were was subsidiaries um, at that point. Um, so a lot of great artists came out of there doing that. Usher was really fourteen. Worked <laughs> him. Was the first one to put Monaco on the radio. WCBX in in uh, Richmond, um, uh, Virginia, and uh, had an amazing run there. So from Arista, I went to MCA Records. And moved to the West Coast. I was the first one to put um, uh, Casey and JoJo all my life. You remember Jesse Powell? You God bless the dead. I yeah. uh, gave the Roots their first and only number one and common um, with Macy Gray, the Light, uh, his first and only number one. Worked the four albums after uh, Mary J. Blige's Four One One. Shante's Got a Man. Uh, matter of fact, <laughs> I forgot. Got a man at home. Yo, Ruckus, <laughs> yo. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Big most record. most deaf, all of those cats. Um, yeah, and then left there, and that's when I started Def Jam in two thousand three. Oh, okay, okay, and that's when um, that run was probably one of the most phenomenal runs in the music business, in modern day music business. When you think about it, because all the different labels that we had, you got to remember during that time, you had Rockefeller was a subsidiary, so so deaf was there, DTP was there. Um, that's when Jeezy and Ross both started and, mm -hmm. and, uh, popped. We had, uh, Murder Inc. We had, uh, you know, and just to name a few. So I did that first artist I signed, um, there was, was, uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was, yeah, Birthday one of the surf. artists I did. And F.O.Y. Remember the Swag Surf joint? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The classic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that was one of the Negro spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. Neek. <laughs> there you go, one of those. And uh, but in that time, you're doing uh -huh. radio, which I mean now is obviously a lot different. You're working the records. You're you're having relationships with the stations. So like, explain to me like how that worked, right? Because working records is a lot different in this day and age. Like at that point, <laughs> what was that entailing? So, so the promotions end of thing is is why why people um, know me 
And most importantly, you know, think about, let's wind back a little bit, right? Because there's an argument whether radio is dead or whether radio is not. Radio is important in making stars, right? And also putting asses in seats. So think of the value of that. And now it's probably more of a marketing element as it used to be the main driver. Like, think about it. Mm -hmm. Artists, when it happened on the radio, they were successful. So I came from the era when it first started where you can make a star from zero to 12 weeks, right? That would be the cycle pretty much to determine whether a record would go or not, which is the equivalent of going viral now, right? So the 12-week window was the same equivalent as going viral, but on from, from a traditional um, perspective. So ideally, when you think about what it takes to become that star and the people who promote records, there's the promoter and then there's the radio station. So the promoters are now, once again, the sales piece, are going to sit in front of these people and sell them on why they should play their records, right? Although you may hear a record over and over again, that process is very, very, very difficult because ultimately every week, those stations only rotate 27 records. They might take two out, but think about every major label, every independent label, everybody is vying for those two same same slots, two or three same slots, mm -hmm. in order to get their opportunity to be heard on the radio. So you said it was a 12 week, what was the 12 week process like back then? Like, well, it was to, you know, get them on radio, push it on radio, get them to end sign. And like, what was the, some of the steps that that 12 week process entailed? So you would, so you would um, warm it up in the street, that would be ideally. So how are you warming up in the street? Yo, that's that's clubs. So streets is clubs, fly is, you know, obviously and a lot of focus and attention was put on hometown. You know, like now if you break, you can be in Greenberg, but you hot in the Netherlands. So that's where you would want to concentrate your focus. Mm. So now the follow the marketing back then you would follow as the stations would start to play records was how you would start to break and develop your artists, um, most importantly. So what's called an impact date is when the official day that people go after um, their record is, 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 is being set up to be introduced to the world, right? From, from uh, a marketing perspective, that's the impact date. Once again, going back to those stations, lining them up, figuring out when's the best opportunity um, for you to impact. And then from there, it's, you know, seeing if it can work. I mean, there's no guarantee one way or the other, but after 12 weeks, you do know whether you got something or you don't. Yeah, and at some point, when they the radio stations see you coming, they probably figuring that you got one. You got it. You got one. Because well, we're gonna make it. If, if well, we're gonna make it. <laughs> we're gonna make we it. Gonna make it <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna make it, B. We're gonna make it. Right. So you you built a reputation. Yes. Based on delivering hits. So I mean, you named a few. Um, I'm starting to think like when I see these uh, visuals and it's a bunch of people in the, the office and they're sitting around tables and there's the artist standing trying to promote mm -hmm. it and then you're in that room too saying mm -hmm. like all right this is what's hot mm -hmm. what's, what's one that you when you heard it you were like all right this one's this is one i mean like every day i'm hustling right that's that was that was like that was automatic right yeah um shoot future mask off you know that was big Big, crazy big tune. you know when i signed them um tony montana was just bubbling when you when you think about it no one really believed he was a southern uh southern rapper you know new york people are funny chicago people are funny west coast people are funny yeah. but once again what you know and what you see and what you feel is what's important so although it's a very analytical business that the music business still is it's still a gut thing and you the people who are really successful are the ones who can marry between knowing what they read on paper and also knowing what the people gonna respond to. So you signed Future? Mm -hmm. Future, Gotti, uh, Cash Out when we were at Epic. Yeah, How, how'd you get introduced to, to that situation? Um, Future, you know, part of what I've done, like since I started in the game, wasn't only just about to promote, was also, you know, identifying talent because as a promoter, if you know how to move the mechanism things you know that can work, obviously you can push the buttons uh, uh, to move them forward. So the first group that I ever signed was uh, this this group out of uh, Albany, Georgia called Field Mob. And that's that's when I learned. Uh, yeah, lonely. yo, B, you really a historian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that actually gave me the bug mm -hmm. on realizing like, yo, I wanna sign Axe. 
and and uh, it, it changed my perspective on getting me to the point of elevating in, in the business because I wanted to know the business end of it all. Like black folks, we only get the opportunity to be the minders, right? Like we're the ones with the talent. You always see us with the talent. Um, you know, that we're the ones that are always at the party, but ultimately you don't see us back doors. We don't get the opportunity to be in the rooms. There's very few um, African-Americans even current day that get the are the check writers or the people who make the true decisions the ones who know okay this is the full budget you know this is how this works this is how we're gonna break this artist so that's what opened the doors yeah for me. I'm, I'm a check writer you're a royalty receiver yeah all right. the difference yeah it's a big <laughs> so <laughs> so you start as a promoter mm -hmm. but now you're learning the business of structuring mm -hmm. deals when i met you that night la reed was with you mm -hmm. and you're like this is my guy He's been, mm -hmm. i've been with him for years is he one of those people that helped you or mentored you in that process of, because of, obviously he had LaFace in the mm -hmm. early nineties. Is he a, a, amongst other people helping you understanding the business of it and structuring deals like that? So this journey for me has been, you know, very profound. The fact that I feel as though I've been held and guided and crafted in every aspect of this business. LA being the last, but I had a lot of, great insight and a lot of visionaries and uh, a lot of people that helped me get to this point. You got to think about, you know, I had an opportunity to work with Damon Biggs, right? Um, I worked with Jay when he was the president and and the artist. I worked with Gerald Busby, you know, um, uh, Sylvia Rohn. You know, I was shoot, probably one of your very few executives that has ever worked with Sylvia in LA together. Cause you know, there was only one time that they've ever worked together is president and CEO. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, he was definitely the one who opened me up and exposed me to the business. And, you know, I thank him for that forever because that opportunity doesn't exist. So, um, what made you get out of the music business? Yo, you know what? I looked at my career and thought about all that I've, I've done. I probably generated over a billion dollars in revenue for, the companies that I work for from the artists that I've signed and the ones I promoted, I didn't get 10% of that. So I don't own anything. Maybe I got 1%, right, of of that. But at the end of the day, I felt that if I could identify executive talent, right? Cause like a lot of my mentees are now the ones that are in position running these companies. And if I can find artists, why not do it for myself? Take that shot. So what was the first step that you did after you left Rock Nation? Yo, decompressed because my whole run, like I literally worked for 30, I worked all my life since delivering papers, like literally worked all my life until I was out with the uh, near death car accident. And that was a pivotal moment, but I still was in the corporate, on a corporate hamster wheel. So I got to the point where it's like, yo, it's time to go to my next step. So like you saw the music business transition from, like you said, street team radio to streaming YouTube. Um, what were your thoughts on like as it was actually unfolding and happening? Did you see like people like trying to act like it wasn't happening, being resistant to it, or like how how was it in the building when things started to like pretty much fall apart because it rebuilt, but a lot of people couldn't figure out what was going on. People were getting fired. People wasn't selling records anymore. The money was drying up for a long time. So how was it like in the building and trying to navigate that change? You know, having worked 60 jobs <laughs> in my life, um, you realize that there are gonna be people who are forward thinking and, and ready to pivot. And then there are people who are gonna hold on to yesterday. And all the ones who held on to the way that it was, you know, time will find you and end it for you, whether you want to or not. So there was a lot of resistance um, for those people who made a lot of money doing business the way that they were doing. I mean, they made a lot of money. Why would you want to change if you're that person? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, as new blood came in, things were gonna change regardless. So it just depend, It just really depended on your mindset. I wonder how much of the pivot was based on uh, you mastering the craft, right? You worked in 30 years. And mm -hmm. I, I've, I've felt this before in teaching and education. It was like, after 10 years of doing something, you're like, all right, I've mastered this. There needs to be a new challenge. And I wonder, after doing 30 years, you know, they say if you do something for 10,000 mm -hmm. hours, right? Obviously, you're putting way over that. Was it, 
a part of you that said, I need to pivot because I've mastered this, I need a new challenge? Or like, what, how much did that play in? So think about it, and back to the seven, uh, seven companies, uh, most people don't realize I've left every company I worked at at the top of my game. So for me, it was always about making room for other people. And, you know, my mother, she she started her career at the post office and she ended at the co at the post office. That's just never, you know, was my drive or, or aspiration to be at one company for the rest of my life. And ideally, as I moved through the music business, I learned a lot, saw a lot. I wouldn't be here if I had stopped at any other point, right? Mm -hmm. If I would have stayed at that one stop, whether it was Motown, MCA, Def Jam, Rock Nation, Epic Records, then that's where I would have been. I wouldn't be at this moment finding new horizons to to over to um to get to. So it was a new horizon. That I mean, that was part of it too. Mm -hmm. Is like I'm a placeholder where somebody with more talent, well, not more talent, but it has fresh talent, can now be in this place. Now exactly. I can I can seek the new thing. Exactly. Uh, okay, got you. So let me ask you this: as far as um, you know, we see a lot going on in the music business right now with artists, and you know, a lot of people getting murdered. It's crazy, but it's nuts. How do you feel hip hop's role has been in shaping black culture? Do you think it's been something that's positive or something that's been detrimental? Like what's your thoughts on it? You know, that's profound, man. I mean, the the real truth to that is I was always conflicted because I came from a deep Christian home. So you gotta realize when I was at MCA, our rap artist, not a knock on anybody, right? Our entree into rap was most deaf, common, the roots. You know, that's different. When I went to Def Jam B, <laughs> Keith Murray, like it was wow. Like it was different. Keith Murray. Yo, it was a whole, yo, X, you know, that was true hip hop. Yeah. So um, for me, the conflict was, is we know the value of, of what these artists are, right? That they will, you know, they're poets. So people will follow. And unfortunately, if you know you guys are um, with children, there's certain things you want your children, you want to move them in a path. And as you rear them, you grow them, there's certain things you won't expose them to, there's certain things you will. And then you'll give them an explanation as they get over and you'll reach them at their level. So with hip hop, and we knew how vast and as wide as it was going, that those generations of kids that would not have folks that would educate them and let them know like, this is art, all this ain't real. Right, like a lot of these cats, this is art. Um, and uh, some of it is really real. Um, that always tore with me. Was it ever, was it encouraged? You mean from the label? Yeah. To move hip hop? To have a, a certain image, to portray a certain lifestyle. For the artists? Yeah. No, the artists came as they came. Artists. So if you're asking, so it's a, well, hold on. That's a complex question. So like, like, like that's a complex we question. We saw see like see before Gusto, right? right? Different things on nature where it's like, all right, yeah. we, we know that gangster rap sells. Yeah. We know that violence sells. We know that, you know, unfortunately, so people that's positive, they usually get labeled as corny or they haven't sold. So it was like, you know, we always hear the stories like of like record executives kind of encouraging rappers to take more of a gangster persona, different things of that nature. I don't know if it's true because I never actually worked in the music business, but you have. So whether it was like directly or indirectly, did you ever see any artists kind of like they came in this way then they started to go this way? <laughs> so let's let's be clear. Um, authenticity, authenticity will always be the driver. Like you can only be who you go and be. People are gonna believe you in the character you become or the true life who you are. So nah, the label didn't sit down and say, nah, you know what, we trying to make another, or we trying to make another, you know, those things don't, so they, they don't really pa they don't really pan out. Well, I, I, I feel like they might have, they might, cause I feel like the vast majority, they they weren't authentic. We found that out later on, like, you know what I mean? But it was like, I feel like it was an act. Even the ones that, like some of my, like some of my favorite rappers, you you find out later on like okay, that's not like prodigies from Long Island. It's, yeah, it's, but it's think that... but think about this though. But that's the that's who they that's their persona. That's who right? they that's what they that's took their, on. That's what they took on, yeah. and that's what they're selling. Right? It's just like no different than 
Like I told you, I was a failed comic. I wasn't Ben, right? I was <laughs> Benny, right? Which is different in how I I wanted the public to perceive me. And a lot of artists were the same way. Yeah, I feel like what you're saying is like, the, it's the J line. Like, truthfully, I want to rhyme like common sense, but I I ain't been rhyming like common sense, right? So like, you were, you were on both sides of that, where it was like, you were, saw Def Jam, but you came from a place where it was like, the most devs in the comments of the world were kind of looked at like, all right, that's conscious rap. Nobody's checking for that. Mm -hmm. Do they have to conform and change or do they just stay themselves? And I feel like, for that, different those paths. Guys, those guys stayed themselves. Different paths. But they never uh, reached a, I feel like Drake, he, he ushered in a whole new wave of artists that, if you look at the top artists in the game, it's ironic because if you look at the top artists in the game right now, they're not gangster rap. Like they're J. Cole, Kendrick Lamar, and Drake. And they're all true to themselves. They're all far from the image that was portrayed. But you still see a strong image of gangster rap, whether it's drill music. Like, so it's hard. It's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because I feel like the music that I grew up on in the 90s was heavily influenced by criminal activity, whether it was Mob D, whether whoever. Like, that was part of it. That was part of the culture. And then Drake came and changed the game. Before that, it was drug culture with Lil Wayne and Future. They 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 took it somewhere else. I think you're leaving one guy out. Who? The guy who he said changed his life. Jay? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yep, not nah, for sure. Yay, yay, pioneered, yay, pioneered that be yourself yeah. backpack on a high level. Drake came and took it to a whole different stratosphere. Yo, Kanye put out Jesus Walks, bro. Nice. Right, Jesus Walk banging in live. Kanye, Yo, Kanye, how crazy is that? Nah, Kanye, he, Kanye, he's, he's the follow. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, yeah. When when the polo shirts and all that, yeah. I think it was be yourself, be and yourself. Then, I think that Drake, his ingredient was be yourself and show the emotional side of it too. I think Kanye was an emotional person. I never saw him make a Marvin. The room. mama, I love you. Yeah, but that's not Marvin's room. But Mar but that's not him as a person. <laughs> <laughs> that's him as a person. Shout out to Tristan. Shout out yeah. to Marvin's room. But, yeah. but then, and then when Drake came, I think Drake opened the door for. J. Cole. Emo. Kendrick. Nah, nah. J. Cole's not emotional. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's emotional, nah, bro. J. Cole? It's just, yeah. I wouldn't say J. Cole's nah, emotional. Say it, it's, it's, it's a different type of emotion. Even that experience of like... Um, it's just true to yourself. But it's also... But isn't it, isn't it indicative of the time, though? Right, that's what people want to hear. Popular music is what people... The, what the, that's what we get past. Yeah. It's what the people want. More so than that's what the individual want. As you was going back to the drug culture piece, that was post eight. I mean, the eighties was on fire, right? It was a whole lot of different element of what we saw in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You know, what was emulated in our movies. All of that was, you know, once again the vine and the the base well, this line is, of what people they wanted to, we, what they wanted but, to hear, what they wanted to see. This is interesting. Does culture move music or does music move culture? I think it. I think music moves culture. The reason why I say that is because I feel like most people are followers and they follow their favorite influencer and the leader. So like even in fashion, right? Like when baggy clothes was in, everybody went baggy clothes. It took Lil Wayne and then, you know, a few artists after that to start wearing skinny jeans. And then everybody, mm -hmm. I don't feel like Skinny jeans started in the streets. I feel like skinny jeans started with rappers transition to the streets. I feel like a lot of gang culture started with rap. Start gang culture started before rap, but it went okay. wide. It went mainstream with rap. It became a mainstream thing. And then everybody wanted to be a gang member once the rapper started to really champion it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. yeah. So yeah. Same, thing, same thing with drugs. Like I don't know. Yeah. How, I don't know how. I never heard a lean until rap. That's the first Fact. time I ever heard a lean. Fact. Was Houston and all that. That was a Houston thing. And then other pockets. And then when Lil Wayne started with the double cup, then it became trendy. So I don't know if the streets influenced the music. I think the music might have influenced the culture. Which is that's and that's that's the scary part about the situation. I mean, music has been impactful in our lives since the drums coming over here, right? Mm -hmm. So we so to your point. I don't, it's maybe it's one and the same, right? Maybe it's, you know, two things can be right at the same time. Yeah. You know, I think it goes both. I, 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 those are great examples, but there's some other ones where it's like maybe the streets started that, right? Like I think it goes both ways. But sense. I think back to the point, you know, where, where you are with it, it's like 
during the Philly International times, everything was about love, right? And people, black power, right? So you haven't, you, you definitely on point. You're not wrong at all. Does music affect culture or culture affect music? I just think once again, you know, two things can be right at the well, same time. I'm just trying to see how can we make a change, right? Because it's like, obviously, this is where I'm going with this. We, we're up against a lot of different issues violence and economic issues and all kinds of stuff. So it's like, we keep saying the same thing of like, the music is just a reflection of the society. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's fully true, but even if it is true at some point, because it's, it's not, we're not making any progress and it's only getting worse. So at some point we have to find a way to just, that's to me, that's kind of a cop out. I'm just rapping about my environment. That's a cop out. Change my environment. I won't have to rap about it. Well, that's not true because you got. No, that's what I'm saying. Like, like that's that's the. You got people like Kendrick Lamar, who is from an environment, but he's not rapping about that destruction. He's no, rapping, he's no. I'm just saying that that be, that's so, usually the end of that sentence. I feel like music because there's nothing bigger than music in our culture, and then sports is second to that. But music is bigger than sports. So at some point, musicians, the music industry, has to take accountability and come up with solutions to do better because if not then so it's, it's a trick it's a, it's tricky though right it's a slippery slope it's cuz i'm on your side i'm all the way in on what's the change going to be because i'm tired of the repetitiveness of you know this is just the way it is but do you, you can't get into the censoring element and aspect of it right because the freedom of it is most important. I think the education of it is where the where we need to put our interest and emphasis, emphasis into our neighborhoods and into our culture and into our young boys. Because equally as we allow, you know, these kids the freedom to make their own decision, we need to now give them boundaries in making these decisions that they're making mm -hmm. and understand the value of what music is doing. If it's like say no to drugs. If you tell them say no to drugs, right, and you tell them all the reasons why, then you got to tell them why it's also not cool to speak to women like this. You need to also tell them it's not cool, like, you know, rap music, what it can do. It's a whole lot more that we need to take into play as we start to build our communities, which I think is is where the core is, right? Because the music is secondary. It's, yeah, the music is secondary. I don't know. I don't think well, that. But I, so here, here's here's the thing, though, right? So like that goes back to the label, and maybe you can give insight from that story, standpoint. It's like we hear artists. La Russell's a great one who had his message is incredible. Even Kendrick, in the sense where his last project, you know, he has a song about daddy issues. It's a topic like that. Men, we've never talked about. I heard him speaking about it. From a label standpoint, are they gonna push that record? And say like, yo, this is the one. Are we gonna fight for this record, or are we not? Because like that that record to me, when I heard it, I'm like, wow, I've never heard a man uh, from this genre speak on an issue like that in so, the way he so, did. So part of what needs, okay, so if we're gonna be radical, right? If you want to be radical about it, um, a lot the people have to uprise in a degree, right? Mm -hmm. The FCC now, you know, there was a time you couldn't say certain things on the radio. True. Right. Like you couldn't curse. Yo, people drop the N word like it's crazy. But, you know, you can't say derogatory things against Jews. Well, that's the right. And you true. just can't. Yeah. Right. So you got to if you're going to make a change, then you got to be about the change. Right. Mm -hmm. Also, too, in these it, it, the companies, the, the boards that decide what is appropriate and what's not that can come out, then you got to petition that. So it's all about, once again, who's in power. And what you're going to do with the power. If we're not at the table, how can you make a change? Well, that and that's the problem. So you said something that was key. You said you can't censor, but you can censor it. You can censor it. And it, it, it has already happened. It's just what is censored. Because it's like, if you look at one of the biggest rap songs of all time, All About the Benjamins, and the only thing that's actually censored in that song, if you listen to it, is when Jada Kiss says, stack chips like Hebrews. They take that, if you listen to Apple Music, they, that part is taken out. It wasn't, I don't even think he meant it in a derogatory way, but the people that's in position of power say you're not going to disrespect our culture. Exactly, and you can't be mad at them. But, so when you say you can't censor it, you can't censor it. Because you could say, I'm going to kill, I'm going to sell bricks, I'm going to do everything, but you can't say that. So you are censored because they, they're they not going to allow you to say that. They're not going to allow you to, 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 you know, say things outside of what they feel is, is 
you know, something that's entertainment because now you took it too far. It's not entertainment no more. That's too far. That's out of bounds. And I feel like even in China, like when you look at like they saying like in TikTok, like their algorithm, it, it suppresses ignorant things. And it, it, so, I mean, that's a model that's working. So it's like, sometimes I think America goes too far with this. Like you can't Yeah, some things need to be censored. Because it's not beneficial to society. I agree with you. But once again, let's go back to the power piece of this. So if if there are only one or two people in the room, and I've been sitting there, you know, I've been in the room when you're the only one, mm -hmm. right? And when you stand for it, you got to be willing to take the consequences that come with it, right? Mm -hmm. These people are making six figures, sometimes seven figures. And when they go, well, do you like this? Yo, who's, yo, these cats ain't built like that. Mm. They not thinking about us. They not thinking about your kids. They thinking about their checks to a degree, right? And it doesn't mean they don't feel it's right or wrong, but everyone doesn't have that. The moral that's not their purpose either, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. That's not that's not why they there, right? Yo, they there for the for the gram, you know. They get, you know, they there for the boats. They there for first class. They there for all the reasons that make it, you know, comfortable for them. But it goes back where what you guys are saying in the platform, like this is something that has to be pushed because there is change. The change can happen, but it has to come from the big outside voices to help the voices on the inside. Because the people on the inside, you can't count on them. The you just at, can't. The people at the table. Yeah, you can't count on but them. But that's because it's not controlled by black people. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And there's, I mean, there's only, how many, three? Like three companies running music? Well, three distribution, three, three yeah, distribution companies right. that are running. Sony, music. Warner, and Universal. And the, the heads of those don't look like us. But even they don't. But it's not that they're not apt to listening. It's it's a matter of okay, what does it look? What does a traditional record company look like? You know, it's probably one of the last businesses that's that's still segregated. Oh, you know that, right? Like there's the black department, and then there's the white department, right? It's uh, urban, urban and, pop. and pop, urban and pop. Like right. you can't be a Pepsi going. You know, you're going to work, yo, the black people going to work Sprite and the white people going to work Coke proper. You just can't. Mm -hmm. So, and ideally it goes the other way. Like, you know, uh, people of um, uh, color don't get to cross over and work the crossover projects. The people um, that aren't, that don't have color, they can go the other way. So, yeah, which doesn't you know, we handicap one way or the other. It's, it's like Cardi B. Like, is she not pop culture? Is she not she's pop popular though, right? So yeah, she's popular. being popular is different. Yeah, but she's not. She's not in that. She would be in an urban category in a sense where she really. I mean, two years ago when she has a number one record, she has the biggest single in the world. Even now, like mm -hmm. she has three diamond records. That would what separates urban from pop at that point? I mean, success, right? Are you the? Are you just the big guy or or woman that's only has appeal? to the urban or black community or you are an artist that transcends and you know you become global that's popular music right so just look at it from that that perspective anyone can become pop mm -hmm. right throughout any genre you can be the most popular, popular artist but um in essence though it's really about how do we make the difference and make the change with the power of the artist and if you think back in the day the executives controlled the artists, hence had the power to make the difference to to um, to control these companies to a degree, right? Or have a louder voice with the black executives in the companies to a degree. And I've seen all of that, right? 30, yeah. I mean, I started at Motown yeah. and ended at Rock Nation. So it's like, you know, you see what can happen from strong rooted black organizations or organizations of color. How is it working with Jay? I mean, Jay's brilliant. I mean, it's not even- Was there a lot of interaction or was he more so just kind of like checking every once in a while and just let you do your, your thing? Jay was in everything, right? Um, but the the biggest interaction I had with him was at Def Jam when he was the president. You know, um, that's when, you know, you really saw his brilliance you know, semi, from that degree. That semi-retirement. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is like before Kingdom yeah. Come. So let's talk about Ye. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you were there for Jesus Walks, you said. Mm -hmm. Talk about that impact that he's had. Because when you know everybody gets to choose their albums, you chose, obviously, Mary, mm -hmm. My Life, which is fitting because on impact, and we'll get to mm -hmm. that. But you chose Twisted Dark Fantasy and said, look, this, this album, this guy changed things in my life. So let's talk about his impact. I mean, 
you know, Kanye from day one was unapologetically, yo, I don't care. Like he had a vision, he had a goal, he executed it, right? And obviously what he saw equally is the value of a team. And that's where I think people fail. You know, we started this conversation like, you know, you guys are an amazing team. No one can do it by themselves. Even if you're a golfer, you need your caddy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and with him, you know, obviously he was his biggest champion, but also too, he had a strong team um, behind him. So it was just amazing watching that, you know, that journey and watching that company, those guys, you know, when you talk about the Rockefeller guys, right? Like, yo, that was an amazing team that was able to push an amazing artist through the funnel. So let's talk about the accident. Mm -hmm. um, how did that happen? And what was life before that and life after that? For you? So in 2014, I was in a near-death uh, car accident, hit a tree at 90 miles an hour as a passenger. I sustained a level two concussion. That's when you black out between uh, one and five minutes, L3, L4 vertebrae fracture, bulging disc in my back, lacerated liver. We hit the tree so hard that it severed two feet of my small intestine. And in that moment, God put a book inside of me called On Impact. And Impact is an acronym that stands for Intuition, Mastery, Pivot, Authenticity, Connection, and Teamwork, which is the pillar of my life. And at the end of each chapter, I put together what I call a hit list of takeaways from the chapter for people to apply to them, their lives because I've gone from paperboy to president and intern to CEO. So I can pretty much meet any and everyone at their level. Prior to the accident, I would say I was, you know, living the American dream on the hamster wheel, corporate citizen, just driving all my time gone. Post, I, I realized the value of time and how important each moment in each day is and how I look at my life now from the day building into a collage. So each day is just a piece of the painting. You, you said you grew up Christian home. I wonder after 2014, how much you lean in on your faith during those times. I mean, that, that sounds like a pretty horrific accident. How much did you lean into your faith at that time to get you through that process? I mean, it became very absolute. Um, you know, when I was in the car, reflecting back on that moment, um, the driver actually passed out. So the car was going for about a half a mile without a driver. And the first thing that came to mind was how my mother disciplined us. And I started speaking to God. And the first thing I said was, Lord, I guess I'm not going to see my family anymore because leading up to that event, I saw everyone. Uh, my wife and daughter were actually standing in the yard. Um, second thing was, Lord, I guess I'm going to see you soon because in that moment, you really do deal with your mortality. Like there's a car barreling down the road at 90 miles an hour without a driver. You know, it can't end pretty. And the third thing I thought about, I got mad with God and I'm glad God didn't get mad with me because I realized there wouldn't be any more celebrations. There wouldn't be any more um, birthdays. There wouldn't be any more anniversaries. You know, who would take care of my mom? You know, who would pour wisdom into my children? Who would marry my girls? And I realized that the most important thing at this point, moving forward, no matter what you're doing, is the time and how you spend it. So you have a different appreciation, you think, for life after that? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I mean, whatever, whatever happens for me will. Whatever doesn't, isn't for me. You know, the value of, of, of just great people means more to me than anything else in the world. Like, that's how I live now. So let's talk about this. The book is, um, it's called, it, it, one of the um, key words is leadership. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you're president of Rock Nation, um, music, you know, you've been a leader. What are some things that you learned? What are some lessons that you can give uh, for leadership? You definitely have to be authentic. Authentic, like. I mean, I think we overplay that word sometimes, but in order, I didn't last 30 years just because I was an earner. I last 30 years because people believed. People believed that, you know, what I said would happen mm -hmm. and what I did and what I said wouldn't happen, wouldn't happen because there was a trust and a bond that was built. And in, in, in order to grow in any business, the people, especially as a leader, you know, you want people to follow, they gotta believe, right? So you gotta, you have to have principles that you live by. 
You have to have um, discernment that you understand, right? You have to be somebody who has vision that people can follow. So that's what's really important in leadership. Okay. Let, let's talk about one of those core principle connections. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I remember being on the phone with you at the time we were trying to uh, sit down with Rick Ross. And you're like, oh, I'll make a call. And then in five minutes, I got a phone call. <laughs> and then we were doing uh, the interview with DJ Khaled at Art Basel. And lo and behold, you're at the side of the stage and Khaled calls your name out. And then we're at Invest Fest and we're backstage and I'm walking with Steve Harvey and he's like, Benny Pugh. <laughs> it feels like everybody knows you, but it speaks to the level of connections that you have mm -hmm. and relationships that you force it. Can you talk about the importance of that? Well, I mean, I'm gonna go back to just the trust piece and also deliver. I mean, at the end of the day, big people expect big results and they don't know how to see it differently. So they lean in on people who they feel can take them to where they wanna be. And also trusting, you know, um, you know, the relationship with Steve, the relationship with Khaled, the relationship with Luda, the relationship with Mary, the relationships of all of the people that I've been involved with is that, you know, and I, and I realize it now being an artist myself, meaning putting out a piece of product, the vulnerability process, mm. never knew that is that, but what I used to tell folks as a new artist coming into my office is I can't work harder than you for yourself. And two, the vulnerability of think about it, someone's art, they're turning over to you to now take to market. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's talk about that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've, you've, you've worked records. Mm -hmm. But now you're on the other end of now you you have the product yourself, mm -hmm. and we spoke a, a numerous times throughout the, the years, and you're like the product is almost ready. Mm -hmm. That creative process. Mm -hmm. What was that to switch to like have that flip where it's like I am now creating the thing that needs to go out to the world. What it's was hard. That? Yeah. No, it was extremely difficult. Like I think people should stop disrespecting the process of be like, yo, I want to do a book or I can do a song. Not professional people do that stuff, right? <laughs> like, it's hard. Like, it's just crazy. Like, people just disrespect the process. Like, I had three editors to to work with me on that because every time I read it, I was like, ugh, still not right. Because ultimately, once it goes out, you're going to be evaluated. You can't go, oh, let me take it back. And uh, I realize now when cats are in the studio, really what they doing Yo, B, that is like a whole nother level of, of of purpose. That's a whole nother level of talent to become successful at something, to become number one at something is uh, you know, it's 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 uh it's a lot. Yeah, you, you put out a product for now to help inspire people, but mm -hmm. on the other end is now people get to critique Absolutely. the story. So, I mean, let's talk about being number one, man. What, what was that moment like for you, Yo, man? That was crazy. <laughs> I was actually sitting on my deck and uh, I went to Amazon and it said, number one new release. And I was like, yo, it was, um, it was surreal, right? Because and the first thought that I had is that I spent my whole life making sure to make other people number one. Like that's what I did in music was making people number one. So to sit and see a one next to my name in in a public space, you know, was uh, was it was very humbling for me. So what are some of the, the things that you saw, you know, successful artists do that struggling artists didn't do? Like, was there something that was like a pretty common denominator where it's like this? Is, I know this person is going to be successful because he has this level of characteristics. Every listen. That's a great question. So when you, like Future, I've never seen anybody like him in my life. Like his report, recording process is insane. What, what, is, what is it? Yo, he's, yo dude, he's 24 hours recording. Like that's why you probably don't even see a lot. Like it's insane how he just, he's a machine. Just in a like he's done, every he's done more records than any and everybody. Like Future has hundreds, maybe thousands of recorded records. Like it's insane, right? His work ethic. I mean, obviously, Jay isn't a billionaire by chance, right? Like his work, his work ethic was, or is like bar none. And I realized that like the first time I ever truly met him in a professional setting was, um, we had an interview when Power came on, um, Power 105. And um, he had an interview at the show. And at that point I said, I wasn't gonna leave it up to a rep 
to meet with him. I was gonna go myself. The interview was at seven. Yo, dude was there at like 6.15. I got there at six o'clock, cause you know, just to get things, rappers don't do that. Like who shows up an hour early? You know, when you think of those, those kinds of that level of artistry and executive paralysis are the ones that make it, right? Those are the ones that go above and beyond and treat it as this is the rest of my life. And they don't see it any other way. There are no other options. I think the new ones that you talk about, they look at the fanfare and that, you know, you that ain't gonna, that ain't gonna last but so long. It comes and goes. Yeah. So you, you had the experience of, of being, working with labels, and now you got the book. Can you talk about what Diverse Media is? Yes. So so Diverse is, is a full-fledged marketing and promotions company as well as distribution. So I have an artist that signed to me. Her name is Paris Gatlin. Um, we actually just dropped her record last week. Shout out. But more importantly, um, it's uh, my opportunity to be in music and also a lot of different um, elements of the business. So music's still there. We're not music. We ain't going nowhere. We don't go nowhere. We don't go nowhere. We don't make a lot did too much. So, um, what's the uh, anatomy of a star, and what are some tips that independent music artists can use to get their their music uh, seen and heard and break through? I mean, the Genesis Qua, you know, that's in you, B. Like when you a star, you know you a star, or you can be a talented artist. I think what people don't take the time to do is realize where do you fit in the spectrum. If, if you've been trying to be an artist for a while and that's not working for you, but you're a great songwriter, then be a song be a songwriter, right? Like Money Long, who was like one of the last yeah. phenomenons that happened, right? She was a writer. Yep. And then, so she made a career being in the art, doing it the way she wanted to do it, and then ultimately switched over and, and put herself in front after having success. So you gotta know where you sit. Um, and you got to be truthful to yourself to realize, you know, how you going to be in this game. That's a perfect example. Yeah. I think about guys like Neo who were writing and then became a star. And Money Long is probably, she's one of those two. Um, he I, worked hard, bro. Yeah. But Neo worked hard at it. Like in the in the transformation. Because you were like, there at that time too. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. broke him. So yeah, can, we you, were there. can you, you said something, you said it's either in you or not. But some people say that you can make a star. Like even if it's not in you, you can make you can make somebody become a star. You used to could, right? That's when the labels controlled, you know, all the gatekeepers. Like you had to come through the label to be successful. You could make a star because you could push you could push forward and push them through. Now, man, the people ain't going for that. You know, I mean, the ones that are successful and popular that go viral, you know, there is a whole audience that love them, and there are people who don't. Like it might not be for us, but it's for someone because it's now, it's truly up to the people to decide who's gonna be and who's not gonna be. This is the, the real making a star. So what's more important, what's more important, the music or the intangibles? Man, it's a perfect storm, bro. It's, it's like, it all starts, don't ever forget that the music business still starts with the music, right? I mean, whether you like the song or you don't, you still gotta have music. Cause I'm looking at, like, I, I, I don't wanna just keep referencing them, but they, uh -huh. they, J. Cole and Kendrick, I don't know if they have any intangibles. They just have music. They're not even on social media. Why you keep playing my man Kendrick? Yo, but no, it's not, it's not, I'm, that's, that's a compliment. But you gotta think no, about, it's no, oh, you say like there's no gimmicks. There's no, no. gimmicks. It's, oh, it's not even that it's good. a gimmick, it's just like. But they one artist at a time, I mean, um, one fan at a time though. Like, he really curated his his niche. They some grassroots too. Yeah, he but curated it, his it's niche. It's only music, like they only pushing music. You don't think of them as mm -hmm. fashion icons. Mm -hmm. You don't think of them as it's doing movies. You don't think of them as comedians. Like, you only look at them for music. That's just it. like rock, rock. Rock bands the same thing, right? But but when Jay, it was fashion. Kanye is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Kanye he's, is he's fashion. All right, but all of them. Yeah. Jay was fashion. It was Beyonce. It was you know what I'm saying like it was liquor. It was all of these different things. Like everybody, Tupac had movies. He had you know Black Power. It was so many different other elements that was attached to him. But with these guys. It's no other elements. I mean, J. Cole plays basketball, but it's no other elements. You say like any other verticals for him? I can't just do an acting. But you don't think about him as an no. actor. You just think about the music. That's it. 
from our perspective, I, there's I guess, no but, like I don't think they have star quality yeah. outside of just being very they, talented. They I, think, I think Kendrick has tried, right? Like he had a shoe, he has a Nike deal, Nike has sponsored him, he has been in movies, he has been on TV shows. It's just that we're not looking at it like yo. But it's okay. It's okay, right? He's, he's but it's okay. He's dabbled in them. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it makes you less of a star when you pulling down a hundred million dollars. No, right? no, it doesn't. Yeah. But that without my question was like, okay. is, is is it music or is it intangibles or is it a combination of both? Because I see some like Fifty Cent is both. It was the music mm -hmm. at first, but it was also the whole persona that he had, and now you know. But I think it's rare when you can just crack through with just the music. But it's possible. It's possible to crack through with just, just the music. But it's also possible to crack through with just personality at this point in time. Like look at Six Nine. He, I don't think his music was ever in tremendous. It was decent at some point in time. Great marketer personality people amazing would, marketer that's it and he became a star but based on all said, intangible how long does it last and hey listen at the end of the day once you figure out where you fit in stay this stay, yeah <laughs> get in where you fit in stay right, right but you have to reinvent yourself absolutely absolutely that's important for longevity but that's gonna be with the music the music the music's gonna give you the longevity not really 50 cent 50 Cent, perfect example. It wasn't music that, that reinvented him. Media did that. But the but the music got him, the music got him to take the next step. The music got him to the point. To, and then to he... trans, yes. And, <laughs> and that's where, I mean, shoot, the music got me to get to a book, right? Music is the entree for a lot of different things. And we do know that if you have success with it. Had he not had success with music, he done. might not be, he couldn't have. Oh yeah, no, he would. Yeah. It's like, he, Rihanna, you understand? Rihanna's another perfect example. Yeah. The music got it to this point where now. I mean, Kanye, Kanye, Kanye. if you think of Kanye, well, Kanye, Kanye music has not matched, no disrespect to Kanye, but his music been not matched for a long time. What, what, don't do that. What, what the last time was that? No, I'm saying when you think of Kanye, like you think a classic of college album? dropout, you think of graduation, you think of Twisted Dark Fantasy, he hasn't reached that level of music in a long time. Let's just yeah. be honest. But he's still his his star power hasn't dropped. If anything, it's actually gained. Yeah, because of the things outside you're saying. Because of fashion. Fashion, yeah. Because of Yeezy brand. I mean, Donda created a whole. That was a moment. Donda what? The whole. But the brought up to, to that to that release. No, he's shutting down the Georgia Stadium. Intangible Stadium's and, and all saying. of that and all this the pyro. It don't matter at this point. It don't matter what the music sound like. Correct. It don't, right. it really, it really That's don't. what I'm saying. Like, like really he had the music. Like he did a whole show and he didn't say a word. So it's just music. <laughs> That's <laughs> just music. But I'm just saying, right? Like, I don't think nobody's checking did. for Kanye's music. Why? Why did they come? He stood in the middle because of Georgia. Stood, that's how he's Kanye. Kanye, bro. He Kanye in, come to anywhere but Alaska they, like but they came, a pop. They came for the music. For the it music. wasn't a fact. It was him in the middle of the Mercedes Benz Stadium that holds eighty thousand, and it was just the album playing. He didn't say a word. Of course, because it's anticipation that anything Kanye does right now is, is a moment that you have to be at. Mm -hmm. It don't matter what it is. Yeah, it could have be been music. a show. It could have been a fast show. It probably would. But then he he's locked himself inside of a room, and now he's working out. And what is he going to do next? But it all revolved around the music. Now the fashion, he could have did it for that too. He could, I mean, he's unique in that sense, right? It could have been fashion, and people would have probably did the same thing. But for that event, it was just the music. I don't think they came for music, though. I think they came because it was Kanye. Nah, man, it's like the hits after hits after hits. Like you can't. I don't. Kanye ain't. I think hit, it's Kanye ain't have a hit in a long time. Retro though. Right, think about it. It's it's retro. It's the retro. But it's not. It's not a concert. It's a. It's what's an it, album. What, what, that's what we got to figure out. What's a hit though? Hit, hit. Like a number one record. Jesus walk stuff like that. That's touch the sky. Like he got. Nah, he don't have to. Nah, he ain't had he that. in a long time, like ten years. Nah, life of Pablo has some joints. Stop doing that to Kanye, man. It's my brother. Kanye, my right. one of my, Kanye, <laughs> my guy. I'm just. I'm just being honest. Life of Pablo has some joints. Jay Z hasn't had a hit in a long time. It's been a long time. Okay, but the catalog. <laughs> I think, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. But but we, I think we have a different conversation though, yeah, go, because go. once you've um, established yourself as a and with a as a catalog performing artist, you're gonna have longevity, right? Like Legacy. somebody, a friend of a friend of mine told me the other day, Diana Ross just had a show it was crazy, right? I need a baker. Yo, yeah, like, like, right? yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. And, and guess what? You got a lot of these new acts right now. They can't sell nothing. They gonna have fifteen artists on the bill, right? Like, yeah, no, it's you, different. They can't go on, on top of them. Disposable, disposable. 
Disposable. Four 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 was a hit album for me. It was a classic album. I'm yeah. just saying, hit. There's no like hit yeah, record, like number one record off that. Number. He's not playing at a versus battle. He's not gonna be playing none of those songs. Oh, it's an emotional moment for him. <laughs> I w- I want to go somewhere though. Shout out to Ho. Shout out to Jay. <laughs> if you're watching, if you're watching, <laughs> uh, let's talk about something. This is one of the first conversations we ever had, and mm-hmm. I, I guess this is one of your other passions, and that's real estate. Oh, absolutely. And I, I don't know if people would be surprised to hear, but when we spoke about it, I was just like, this is incredible. More people need to talk about it. Where did you get the, you know, the feel for it? Like, was that something growing up that you saw? Like, were your parents introducing you to that? Where did you come in contact with real estate investing? So the first thing for me with real estate is we grew up here in White Plains in a five-family house. In the winters, it was uh, really cold, no insulation, and the summers was really hot. And what I realized, um, the house gave my father the freedom to do what he wanted to do. My mother worked at the post office, so we had we had the benefits covered. And um, it was it was amazing just to have my dad home with us, but also to see how he lived as a man, right? And when he, uh, I refer to him as the Black MacGyver because he's able to do anything, right? <laughs> and uh, the lady who owned the house, she gave my parents the opportunity to purchase. They didn't have the money, so she held the paper. So she went from living here, moved back to Kansas, let my parents obviously holding the papers. She was the bank. And at the end of the day, they was able to pay the house off and that gave us freedom. You know, we had able to take little light vacations, you know, we could stay current on things. And that was the spark for me. So when I got in the music business, realized that there were no no salt and pepper hair black men walking around. So at that point, I figured I have to make my own retirement. You know, I have to figure out my own destiny. And that's when I started purchasing real estate with every bonus I got. So for 20 years, I would buy a condo, a co-op, uh, multifamily, uh, residential, and even got it to the point where I owned the city block in Hartford um, from those bonuses that came in. So that was- When the you was point. buying it, was it other colleagues investing with you? Or nah, Dolo. Did they know about it? Uh, people know. They just wasn't interested? Nah. It wasn't popular back then? Yo, Cats was just doing different things, man. And you know, I found that was best for me um, at that time was was doing it myself. Now I informed, like the people who work for me, I made sure that everybody that worked for me, they bought where they lived. Mm. Everybody that worked for me, like, listen, you couldn't make this money because the music business is a lotto, right? You go from being an intern to you might be making $300,000 like that two hundred fifty thousand dollars like that but you know that cycle's gonna burn so Mm -hmm. ultimately you what are you gonna need you're gonna always need shelter a roof over your head so as people came in i showed them how to you know go get a mortgage showed them like yo the value if you had to own where you are you figure everything else out but you want to be able to to sustain and and have your own home what was your strategy multi-family homes or just like when you was investing did you have anything particular or just i did it all um, I look for cherries. So for me, the my the vast part of my portfolio was in Hartford because when we moved back from California in 2003 to buy a six family was like a million dollars, but the but the return might have been fifty thousand. So you're gonna lay out all this money, right? And and at the end of the year is fifty thousand. Mm. But in Hartford, you could buy a six family and get the same return. So. I was like, yo, this is where I'm going to be at. So I went up and started buying multis up there. So obviously, I mean, you're not, you weren't living there. So did you have to figure out a property management team that like a construction team? Like, did you have to build a real estate team around the portfolio? So how I set it up. Um, so I kept that in the family. So me, my cousin and my dad, we did maybe like 90, 100 renovations of the apartments that we had. So what our strategy was when we first moved in, What's the first thing that can go wrong? Plumbing and electrical. So we upgraded all the plumbing and electrical, and then we did every, you know, did all the cosmetic stuff mm-hmm. so that we wouldn't have problems for 10, 15, 20 years um, with, with, with the apartments. Then the second thing, in the multis, I would always put someone um, who was handy. So whether it's that lived in the building, um, and I'd subsidize the rent, either half the rent or no rent at all sure. because deep in the hood, right? So no dogs, got to keep the dogs out because, you know, the dope boys is coming with that, right? They go, no pits, no rots, no nothing. 
And um, that's how we were able to maintain and not be absentee. Because what was important for me in low income was that the people felt vested and people wanted to live next to people that they wanted to live next to. And I'd always get referrals. So like for people who would, um, if we had a vacancy, you know, if you referred, I give you half, right? Because now you're going to do the vetting process for me, mm. right? Because once again, people want to live next to people they want to live. So you'll call your cousin or you'll call a guy at work. You know, my landlord, he's good. You know, he takes care of the exterminators, all those things. So that's what worked that we were able to manage 130 units without a management company. That's, that's, that's it, man. So before we wrap, I just want to give you opportunity. Anybody that's going to get this book, what can what can they expect to to get out of it? What do you want them to get out of it? What's most important for me in, in putting this together is pretty much if I can do it, you can do it too. Like, um, it's really important to meet people where they're at. And in putting this together, I realized that it was important for me in my journey to like what we were talking about the music, to put together a piece of literature that people can have an opportunity or a roadmap to figure out like, yo, I don't like this job. What do I do? Yo, you know what? I just graduated college. What do I do? Yo, I'm a manager, CEO. I don't know how to connect with my staff. What do I do? You know what? I'm I'm trying to figure out my spirituality. What do I do? Well, I've been through a lot of those things. So anyone picking this up, this will this will be a great opportunity for you to figure out like, yo, you know what? If I make a little a few adjustments or some pivots, I can do it too. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, on impact. There it is right there. By Benny Pugh. Where can they get it? Yo, wherever books are sold. That's Amazon. A fact. That's a fact. <laughs> so I actually purchased the book. Thank even you. though it, you know your, your people sent it over and gifted it. I wanted to support, obviously, because you know, we've had talks about mm -hmm. this book coming. Um and so I anticipated it and once I saw that it came out, I was proud to be a part of the the number one, making it number one. So Appreciate congratulations, it. congratulations to you, my brother. This is a this is an important piece. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. This will be on the book stand over here at the EYL headquarters. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the headquarters. <laughs> I made it. That is a fact. That is a fact. Nah, thank you for joining us. Nah. We'll see you at uh one other event, probably Art Boz. Oh, before we leave, talk about your event. You got an event coming up, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, yeah, it's your, your time. It's your time conference, which is actually the live version of the book, um, in essence. So I'm going to do Martin Luther King weekend 2023, um, four days. We're going to do two days auditions. So we're going to have some cats come out and perform in front of some really heavy uh, label individuals. Then we're going to have two days of conference Saturday. We'll do a host of different kinds of things, you know. Uh, real estate, how to get hot in Charlotte. We'll do um, estate planning. We'll do uh, crypto. We're going to do all of those different kinds of things. Some of the people that I've met um, doing this journey. And then at the end on Sunday, uh, we're going to give away $10,000 to someone to bet on themselves. So super excited about that. It's your time. You it's have, your time. Man. It's your time. How, where can I get the tickets? Yo, they can go to either BennyPew.com or It's Your Time Conference.com. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Troy, housekeeping items? Yeah, shout out to everybody on Patreon.com. Shout out to all our earners on EYL University, and shout out to everybody that's supporting the merch. shadi has got on that. That's my favorite one, that's actually. Exclusive. That's the exclusive orange. The orange joint. That's, that's that New York, Nick, New York Met orange. And um, I got that Joker purple on, so stop playing yourself. Go support my brother, Benny Pugh, on Impact. Go do that now. Don't play yourself. This is one of those things that you can reward yourself with. Um, again, congratulations to you on the book, man. A long time coming. And I'm happy that we got to sit down and get this done, man. Man, I it's appreciate been it. a long time coming. Thank you all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, brother. All right, God, thank you for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> A mic drop. Bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs>